Light wood framing is the construction technology that built America. It is the most popular way to build the most common type of building, the single family residential house. There are almost a million houses built this way in the US alone just last year. Light wood framing is so common that it seems like it's been around forever and its biases, or the kinds of buildings that we build with it, just seem so natural as a way of living that we don't even question it. The gable of a roof, the average size of a room, or the size and placement of a window all snap neatly into the structural capacity and tendencies of this construction method. Wood framing forms a natural background and stage set for the activities of domestic life, and it doesn't make sense to build any other way when every Home Depot or your local lumber yard in every town stocks exactly what you need. But it's also for these reasons that I want to dig a little bit deeper to discover more about light wood framing. Why is it so unquestionably the standard way of doing things? How, where, and when did it develop? And what allowed it to become so popular that it would spread so thoroughly throughout the United States? That's why I'm here at Wrightwood 659, a museum in Chicago which currently has an exhibition on view dedicated to showcasing the genius of wood framing. It features accurately detailed scale models of famous wood frame constructions like a round barn, which is a typical building type found around here in Illinois, and even the doghouse from Tom and Jerry. The curators, Paul Anderson and Paul Preissner, or the Pauls, laid wood framing bare to allow us to appreciate its simple genius. But the heart of this exhibition is this pretty incredible proto building that's squished in a three story gap between the museum's floors and its facade. It's a building within a building. It doesn't exactly look like a typical house, but it uses all the standard details of one, like the studs which are 16 inches apart, or the header in the doorway, or the roof joists. Its role is to put us up close and personal with a building that is frozen within a fixed state of partial construction. When this is then placed into the context of a museum, it allows us to look closer and examine it in a new way. For most Americans, it might seem crazy that something like this could be a novelty or in a position to explain something nuanced about the world at large. We just see it all the time and probably never consider how it got this way. So when we do look a little closer, what do we see? Well, I think wood framing is particularly American in how it works in the same way that the hamburger is. What allowed hamburgers to take over as the quintessential American cuisine and to get exported everywhere are the very same cultural, economic, and historical confluences that contribute to the proliferation of the light wood frame for construction. Light wood framing is the hamburger of the building industry. If you're hungry, you might want to pause for a second to grab a snack before we answer the question, how is wood framing like hamburgers? To start, they both take advantage of a process that leaves very little waste, or they utilize materials that otherwise would have been waste. For hamburgers, it's ground beef, which is made from all of the offcuts from the butchering process. For light wood framing, it has to do with getting usable wood members from a tree. You can think of prime cuts like a steak to be like big straight cuts of wood, but because trees are round and framing construction prefers square or rectangular members, there's a lot of excess. Cutting the trees into smaller parts allows you to take advantage of more of the tree. Secondarily, sawdust and other offcuts can be used to make products like OSB or oriented strand board, which is also useful in other parts of the construction process. So baked into both hamburgers and wood framing is an attitude about making something useful and delicious without relying on the best and most coveted ingredients. But before we continue with that hamburger breakdown, I think it might be useful to talk a little bit more about how light wood framing works, in case you're not fully familiar. We already made the distinction between large pieces of wood versus smaller ones. And light wood framing, as a type of structural framing in buildings, is distinct from the kind that always uses those larger pieces of wood, which typically go into what's called timber framing. Timber framing, also known as post and beam construction, uses large, rough-hewn, usually squarish members that are larger than four inches on each side. These pieces are cut to size and otherwise worked in a sawmill away from the construction site. The refined components are then brought to the site and fitted together into the final building. Timber framing was the most popular form of construction for all frame houses in the 17th and 18th century America, but it required that buildings be built more like a piece of fine furniture than like a mass-produced product. Light wood framing, on the other hand, uses much smaller pieces of wood, usually in a module of 2 inches. 
and these are bunched together in a much closer interval to achieve the necessary structural rigidity. Rather than building buildings like pieces of furniture, they can be constructed more like products on an assembly line, which really underpins how lightwood framing was able to claim such a large percentage of the market. So lightwood framing is economical and efficient in the same way that hamburgers are, but that's not where the similarities end. We don't know for sure exactly when and where hamburgers were invented. With claims made for locations such as Hamburg, Germany, all the way to Texas, and even up into Ohio, it's likely that hamburgers sprang up in various places during the late 1800s based on a confluence of different factors. Lightwood framing is like this too, just a little bit earlier. And Chicago has a pretty strong claim to make as the place of origin starting right around 1830. For a time it was even called Chicago framing and then American framing for how quickly it was embraced and spread throughout the United States at a time where people were looking to colonize a giant territory. A candidate for the first light wood framing building is this one that's modeled right here. It's a St. Mary's Church built in 1833. This is a model of a round barn, which is found all over Illinois. It deploys a technique of framing called balloon framing. This term was originally meant as a derogatory term, meaning that it appeared so light that it could float away like a balloon. But this lightness was actually became its asset. Anyway, balloon framing is defined by the relationship between the outer walls and the floors in between. The studs of the outer walls go all the way up from the foundation to the roof, and then the floors sort of notch into it. But balloon framing isn't the kind of framing that we use today for a few different reasons. First is that the cavities, which go all the way up, become great places for fire to travel up from floor to floor. And secondly, the outer studs have to be really, really long. You're already at 22 feet for a two-story structure. This means you'll need particularly tall trees just to be able to build a typical house. Over time, and further west in the United States, another more refined method of framing developed called platform framing. In this method, all the walls stop at every floor, and then the floor rests on all the walls, even the outer ones. This creates a fire break, and it limits the length of studs needed to just the height of the single floor. This model is an example of a house from Levittown, Pennsylvania, and it exemplifies platform framing which is built more like layers that set up on top of each other, like a burger. The form factor of a burger also allows for mobility and easy consumption that can happen standing up, with or without plates. And the limited size of lightwood framing also means that it's easy to transport. One person can easily handle moving a few 2x4s around, and a truck or a train cars can efficiently pack everything into cubic masses. These kinds of logistical efficiencies allowed wood framing and burgers to become industrialized at a scale never seen prior. New vast scales of production and light wood framing was possible by industrial inventions like the steam-powered sawmill, coupled with the plentiful nature and ease of growing Douglas fir trees, the basic ingredient of a 2x4. These kinds of efficiencies all add up until you arrive at the end game of mass-produced stick frame houses like a Sears house or say Levittown where wood frame houses are being mass produced at unprecedented rates during the 1950s. And if you think about it, this also coincides with the rise of McDonald's, which I don't think is a fluke. Americans seem to prefer standardization over variety. Think of the ethos that drives a McDonald's hamburger. No matter where you are, you know that if you get a McDonald's hamburger, you'll know what it will taste like. Standardization is seen as a positive step to simplify a process, a pathway to saving time and money. A more standardized system that uses the fewest number of special parts takes absolute advantage of economies of scale. Wood framing is like that too. Almost any 2x4 is about as good as any other 2x4. You know what you're going to get, and almost anyone will do. That's because strength is achieved through redundancy of simply attached and self-similar elements rather than through highly crafted parts. So let's just compare and contrast a typical detail from timber framing to its wood framing counterpart to understand the importance and simplicity of nails. With timber, the ends of each piece of wood needs to be specifically shaped in order to have them fit together snugly in a structurally stable way. The most common form is a mortise and tenon that ensures these weighty elements fit snugly and stay together. But all of this cutting and shaping of a specific piece of wood requires a lot of skill. And even the moving the wood around requires multiple people and equipment all working in unison. Friends are up. And they're off. And Kaylee's Koski. Oh, look at Kaylee Koski go. 
but 2x4s are easily moved, and with a few common shapes, you can combine them with simple tools and a handful of simple fasteners into a vast array of constructions that we see today. This means you don't need skilled labor to produce wood framing. It so happens that almost anyone can also build a burger, you know, but some are better than others. And the amount of training and expertise to put up wood framing means that so many more people can build a house than would be possible otherwise. Despite having a limited set of main ingredients, wood framing can support all sorts of recombinations. From absolute standardization comes infinite variety. All this leads to a remarkably democratic product. Hamburgers feed the poor and the wealthy equally. Now you can get them almost anywhere, from the greasiest diners all the way to the fanciest restaurants. In the same way that a modest home or a mansion can be made out of the same exact two by four pieces. You can dress it up differently, or serve it in more generous or more restrictive amounts, but there's no pretension that its perfect adequacy should never be looked down upon. This video was made possible by the generous support of Brilliant. Brilliant is a learning experience that challenges you with progressive and interactive programs, puzzles, and exchanges that fully feel like entertainment. Fittingly, I was just doing a puzzle that let me learn and explore the behavior of frame structures. The puzzle challenged me to create the most efficient bridges with as few beams as possible. Even after getting the answer, I found myself testing different combinations just to see how it would fail. It's not just about getting the right answer, it's about exploration, guided only by your curiosity. To that end, Brilliant has lessons for everyone. You don't have to be an architecture professor like me to appreciate it. There are life applicable topics to match your curiosity, and Brilliant even offers an entire community to help inspire and keep you excited about learning. And to be clear, I am not a puzzler. I don't even have a single game on my phone. Instead, what I'll do is I'll start a lesson with Brilliant on my computer on a lunch break, and then maybe pick up where I left off on my phone later on while I'm waiting somewhere else. And you can too with the deal that we worked out together, where the first 200 people to click on the link down in the description, brilliant.org slash Stuart Hicks, will get 20% off their annual premium subscription. So get started playing and learning with Brilliant today. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. We'll promise more videos asking important questions about the built environment just like this one. While you're waiting for those, check out some of these other videos. See you over there.